Uh, I'd like to present our second speaker, Keith Winshuttle. Keith Winshuttle is an Australian writer, historian, and a former ABC board member who has authored several books from the 1970s onwards, and which include Unemployment, 1979, which analysed the economic causes and social consequences of unemployment in Australia, and advocated a socialist response. The media, a new analysis of the press, television and radio, advertising in Australia, 1984, on the political economy and content of the news and entertainment media, and The Killing of History, 1994, a critique of postmodernism in history. Also, The Fabrication of Aboriginal History, Volume 1, Van Diemen's Land, 1803 to 1847, published in 2002, which accuses a number of Australian historians of falsifying and inventing the degree of violence of the past. Make the White Australia Policy, 2004, a history of that policy which argues that academic historians have exaggerated the degree of racism in Australian history and the fabrication of Australian history, of Aboriginal history, I beg your pardon, volume three, The Stolen Generation, 1881 to 2008, which argues the story of the stolen generation of Aboriginal children is a myth. He has been editor of Quadrant magazine since 2008. I'd like you to welcome Keith Winchell. Thank you for the invitation to the uh, organisers of this forum. In August 1977, in the middle of the Soviet Union's Brezhnev regime, the British journalist and broadcaster Bernard Levin made the most amazing prediction of the 20th century, or for that matter, of any other century. Writing in the Times of London, he predicted the Soviet Empire would fall in 1989. Now, Levin turned out not only to be right about the fall, but about why it would happen, not from external pressure, but from internal dissatisfaction of its captive populations. He was also right about how it would happen. Those who rose up through the Soviet system would eventually lose faith in it and loosen their control. And he predicted almost to the day when it would happen. He nominated the 200th anniversary of the fall of the Bastille in Paris uh, that is, um, July 14, 1989, as the date. And the Berlin Wall actually fell on November the 9th of that year. Now, Levin's confidence in his prediction came about because he believed the thirst for freedom and decency amongst millions of people who had suffered repression for decades could not remain unslaked. It is simply not credible, he wrote, that forces which have moved men and women in countless millions throughout the ages exist only in sketchy form in the Soviet Union, in the hearts of the few who speak about them openly. The charge is there, packed tight, tamped down and waiting. Uh, the fuse is laid, all that remains is the match, unquote. In the previous century, the 19th century, the novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky made a prediction of his own based on different assumptions <coughs> about a particular, much narrower group of people. And in his novel, The Possessed, which I presume some of you may have read here, it also translated as The Devils, it was published in 1872, Dostoevsky predicted the brutality and murder that would follow if the Russian revolutionaries ever got into power. He also described very accurately the kind of people who became <coughs> revolutionaries. They were not poor, uneducated or morally corrupt, driven by desperation or evil ambition. Instead, they were personally unselfish and held the highest ideals. Although most had religious upbringings, they had given up religion to seek a secular cause worth living for and worth dying for. They abandoned the hope of heaven in the afterlife for the creation of heaven on earth in this life. They imagined, they imagined themselves people of the purest of hearts Saint-like, but once they gained political power and sought to put their ideals to work, Dostoevsky said, they let no one stand in their way. And in doing so, they quickly descended into the personification of evil, committing obvious and undeniable villainy, unquote. 
Now, like Levitt's prediction, Dostoevsky's was uncanny in its accuracy. Between the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, their collaborators and imitators produced the greatest mass homicide in human history, with at least 100 million people dead. Now, of course, revolutionary socialists are not the only people on the left. There has long been another political choice, the Social Democrat, or Labour left. From the perspective of the revolutionary left, the Social Democrats are naive and gullible to imagine <coughs> they might have an alternative route to the perfectly just society, or, as in Australian parlance, the light on the hill. Lenin described Social Democrats and their kind as useful idiots, <laughs> as allies of the revolutionaries, but, they did not, but who did not actually realise they were allies. And again, Dostoevsky foretold all this in The Devils. One of his re revolutionary characters explains, I'm quoting him, A teacher who laughs with his children at God is on our side. The prosecutor who trembles at a trial for fear he should not seem progressive enough is ours, ours. Among government officials and literary men, we have lots, lots, and they don't know it themselves. Unquote. Now, just to uh, put 19th century ideas in the context, a 21st century context, context let, let me give you one uh, in, contrary example of the useful syndrome idiot we still uh, live with today. One of the most persistent beliefs of social democrats and, and progressive people generally is that bad behaviour and criminal acts are not the responsibility of those individuals who commit them. When they see unrest, riots or violence by members of the lower orders, social democrats almost instinctively reach for social explanations of the causes. Racism, inequality, unemployment, or the failure of government to address such root causes. In a recent essay, the Marxist historian Eric Hobsbawm said that this notion that crime was generated by social forces beyond the control of individuals actually originated in the book The Condition of the Working Class in England in 1844, written by Karl Marx's collaborator, Frederick Engels. In other words, those who abandon personal responsibility for bad behaviour and instead blame society give helpful ammunition to those demanding radical social change as the solution to every social ill. We should recognise, however, that on many issues today, contemporary social democrats have actually ceased to be leftists. And the recent visit to Australia of Barack Obama demonstrated this, I feel, very clearly. Uh, his program to create a Pax Americana in the Pacific, that is, a regime of free trade guaranteed by American military power, did not spring from his own cab cabinet, let alone his own principles. In fact, the concept actually arose in discussions several years ago between George Bush and John Howard. And, as, and as, if you read um, Spectator Australia uh, this week, Alexander, Alexander Downer has the diary section, and he reminds us there that um, this Pax Americana nation was officially launched in 2006 by Dick Cheney, um, George Bush's Vice President, by Brandon Nelson, who was then Minister of Defence, and, and Downer himself, who was then Minister for Foreign Affairs. So it's no wonder the Greens and the old Labor left faction were kept out of the loop until after Obama's announcement last week was presented as a fait accompli. Uh, in, in fact, Obama and Julia Gillard have a lot in common. Both come from backgrounds deep in the radical left. One of Obama's long-term advisers and mentors was Bill Ayres, the former 1960s political activist and urban terrorist who spent a couple of decades in jail for attempting to, bo to blow up a, um, a, a marine base in, um, in the United States. Uh, Julia's initiation into post-university politics was with the Socialist Forum, a successor to and inheritor of the resources of the former Communist Party of Australia. But both have now given away leftism not only in foreign affairs, but in several other areas as well. And indeed it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the most these social democrats want uh, out of their careers is jobs for themselves, to get the jobs and keep them jobs and all the attention and photo opportunities that go with them. Their ambition is to be somebody in this life, not one of the many nobodies who vote for them. And while Julia is still delivering on the big debt she and her party owe to the trade union movement, 
The only other substantial political agenda of the left is to turn everyone else into people like themselves, to use the power of the state to make others conform to their approved <coughs> codes of speech, taste, sexuality, parenting, body fat, and even their gambling habits. The main, their main game is not democracy or liberty, but conformity. In other words, leftist politicians can turn into conservatives on many issues these days, but they still find it very hard to eliminate their original authoritarian streak. Now, in pursuing this agenda, not only in Australia, but in every country where they still operate, the Labor left has turned democracy into a giant system of bribery for every imaginable interest group that will support them. The left will spend whatever it takes to stay in office, even if it threatens their country with bankruptcy. But it's very clear, however, that now this game is only one move away from checkmate. The Keynesian economics that justified continued spending has been eclipsed by the current global debt crisis. No one is talking anymore about spending their way out of this crisis. And the lenders are worried not only about the ability of countries as big as Italy and Spain to pay back their money, but even of the United States. And if you want to see the typical career tra trajectory of the, um, of the future social democratic politicians, then look at the face of George Papandreou, the now ex-Prime Minister of Greece. Early in his career, Papandreou was a political idealist. He was the leader of the Pan-Hellenic Socialist Movement, PASOK, and as recently as 2006, he was president of the Socialist International. Last week, after a failed attempt to introduce a program of capitalist reforms to stave off Greek bankruptcy, he resigned in ignominy to, re to be replaced by an unelected capitalist economist. Greece no longer has a prime minister, no longer has a demo demo democratic uh, leader deciding its economic future. So for social democrats today, there is no light on the hill anymore. In fact, the only, the only honest political position that remains to a Labour politician is that, um, am I getting the hurry up call? No, or that's not the case. Yeah, this is the oh, parliamentary. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the House of Journey. Post. Okay. The only honest political position that remains today for a social democrat is that of a self-interested opportunist. But if, if my uh, depressing scenario is even half accurate, uh, we have, and, and we have entered an age of political cynicism and mediocrity with no place for heroism, then as we speak, there must be a great political vacuum opening up amongst our younger generations. Given that human beings learn very few lessons from history, uh, in what direction will, that, will those of the younger generation who are highly educated, unselfish, and ardent young intellectuals, described by Dostoevsky, what way will they turn? Well, these are times in which human nature will probably produce youthful idealists who will set out in pursuit of a cause to live for and to die for, but who, despite their best intentions, will also develop a taste for villainy, violence, and homicide. The times will, just as predictably, produce their useful idiots, better known as social democrats, plus the teachers, the government officials, the literary men, and anybody else I haven't forgotten to insult, uh, that Dostoevsky identified as their uncomprehending allies. Fortunately, however, human nature can also be relied upon to produce adversaries of the left. The human spirit within the captive populations that Bernard Levin nominated as the deep force that ended communism in Europe in 1989, will always be there too, a charge waiting for its detonator to throw off its oppressors. So, what is the future of the left? Well, the human condition being as it is, the left will always be with us. But so will its opposition, the Friends of Freedom. Thank you.